Okay, ladies, thank you both for joining the Novel Idea Society. Um, we are recording this for people who can't make it later on. For people who don't know me and this is their first foray into the book club, I'm Sam McKeg. I host the six o'clock uh, CBC Saskatchewan newscast, which is why I have the hilarious gem behind me. This is actually my desk. This isn't like product placement. This is actually where I sit. Um, Marissa Stapley and Karma Brown are actually Maggie Knox. If you didn't read the, about the author, you might be wondering why there are two people here and not one. Thank you both for coming. Um, I'm going to ask you where you are, both of you. Marissa, if you want to go first, tell me like what city you're in and tell me about your day today. <laughs> well, I'm in my office. I've turned, I've like, I'm facing more of the ceiling than usual because all of the Christmas presents that I haven't wrapped yet are on my floor. <laughs> my day today was spent running around Christmas shopping. I haven't showered yet. <laughs> Just so you know, I've had a crazy day. I was in Walmart. I saw both of our books. Um, and Yes, my day was just spent running around, just adding little things for my kids because I thought I was ready for Christmas. And this happens to me every year. I'm never ready. Yeah, you were saying that you were so ready. No. You just said that. Okay. Hmm. It happens. It's it always, happens. you know, they're, they just don't allow for the last minute stuff. And yeah. I also, I shop early. I think I have enough. And then I start wrapping and I feel I don't have enough. And I just... I, love, I have great kids and they get so excited about Christmas. And then I think, uh oh, they're so excited about Christmas. Am I delivering? So, yeah. What city are you in? I guess I should ask. I oh, Toronto. From, in Toronto. Yes. Okay. And Karma, where are you? I am in Kimberley, Ontario, which is a little town uh, a couple of hours north of Toronto. And we are skiers. So, ski season has begun. So, we're up here just sort of pre-Christmas pre uh, doing a few days of skiing, but I got my booster shot yesterday, which was very exciting. Um, but I, for some reason, when I get booster, when I get vaccines, I do not sleep. So I have been up since 1 a.m. So I don't even know where, what I did today. I can't even tell you. I don't remember. I've been up for like 18 or 19 hours. So it's, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Feeling just ready. Another 19, no problem. So <laughs> okay. but I'm not Christmas shopping up here no so how did you two meet how did you how did this relationship start I can't really remember anymore there's some dispute right I thought we met when we went to see Chris Cleave at the North York library but you told me that, that was our second date dinner that I yeah. arranged with our women writer friends that we now commune with a lot in, in Toronto called the coven, which you're right about that. So we met that night, but we didn't really get to talk. So we went um, to see Chris Cleave, who was fabulous. He did this talk about, actually, I feel like it was a lot to do with the war rations and he had a slideshow and he yeah. researched rations and it was strangely fascinating. And also he just is a lovely person. And then that's how we became friends. And that was, yeah. Like five years ago, six years ago, six, six years, maybe years ago. Um, yeah. And then we just, we, we have so many wonderful mutual author friends and we've just had a lot of good times. And in the before times we did a lot of fun events and hopefully we can do that again in person and just yeah. really get to know each other. Karma, do you remember the story the same way? Cause I find reading stories are never the same from people I you know what I do I mean I have for some reason we went to this amazing um vegan it's vegan right Marissa a restaurant and no, a vegetarian uh, Pat, Pat, Pasha Pat, Pasha but not vegan like they had it's just that you remember the cauliflower which I then I remember the cauliflower yeah, because, because it was, like it was the whole roasted whole cauliflower head yeah of cauliflower with pomegranate seeds and it was delicious and I was so excited I'm a vegetarian so I was excited to be somewhere where I wasn't like everyone else was eating steak and I was eating the cauliflower. So I remember that distinctly. And then I, all these women I had just met. So yeah, I, but that I really, our second date was going to see Chris Cleave. But that, then that was our second date. Over, yes. And then I was so excited because I was like, I recreated the cauliflower in my Dutch oven and I <laughs> lit off and I was like, I have this like standout vegetarian thing. <laughs> sure. It wasn't the same as, but anyway, it, yeah. delicious. It, it, it's, um, it was a good way to treat the vegetarians in your life to be like Ta -da! <laughs> it actually is quite time consuming to do a whole head of cauliflower to do it well it does take some time so you have to 
you, you know, that's, that's caring about yeah, I, your I dinner showed, guests. I showed my care. So I think yeah. we both do remember that vividly because I, it's a lot about cauliflower though. So I know maybe our beginnings. <laughs> Friendship forged Connect. over food. Those are good ones. Yeah. Yeah. So where did the name Maggie Knox come from? Well, we, we went through a lot of different names trying to come up with our pen name. We knew that we needed a pen name because we were both writing, we have different projects and it was important for us to have one name. And, and we, we liked the idea of it sort of being a little bit, it's not anonymous, but just having that, that one name on the cover. And we needed an M and a K for Marissa and Karma. Um, Marissa's granny was Maggie. She had a granny Maggie, right? And um, who was a singer and really wanted to use that name. And then Knox was just the K. There had been another name before that, but we couldn't use it because there was another author with that same name um, at Penguin. So we changed it to Knox. And really it was practical in some ways. We needed a short name, easy to remember, fit in one line on the Mm -hmm. cover. So that's Maggie Knox. But she sort of developed her own personality in and she there's some hijinks that happen with Maggie in our email inboxes and crashes your website and crash my website I it's just it's strange it's (laughs) like she is her own entity what do you mean hijinks well we will lose things I mean we will lose passwords and we will go to try to get back into our Maggie Knox social media accounts with passwords that we think should work, that we have shared with one another and they don't work. And then, right? Like weird stuff yeah. like that. And where weird we stuff just... is happening in the manuscript. Not so much for all I want for Christmas, but the stakes aren't that high yet, right? Because we yeah. haven't like, published it yet. Like so. there would be changes that we didn't remember making. And then, but we just didn't know if maybe we just, I mean, you know, it was, there was a lot happening. So maybe we just weren't remembering, but we, we like to say maybe it was Maggie just messing with us a little bit. So do either of you come from twin families or where did the Goodwin twins come from? I don't think they come from our families, although I do have twin cousins. Um, But I think it was more just that we, we love, we were talking about what would be fun to write. And I think a a swap, like a good swap just came to mind. And and I think it kind of had to be twins, right? Because I don't yeah. exactly buy like the princess switch, for example. With the it just you happen with to with a double person. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And I mean, who doesn't love the parent trap? So I think that's where where that and came Sweet from. Valley High too for me. Mm-hmm. I grew up yeah. reading so many Sweet Valley High novels. So the um, those twins were top of mind for me. But yeah, parent trap, a swap. We just wanted to have some fun with it. Mm-hmm. So you often see authors write with another author author you'll see like five Kessler and so and so or James Patterson and so and so but I've never understood how two authors who don't live in the same place who don't normally write together put a book together and agree on like plot points and where things are going to go and who's the specialist in what area like who's which one of you is obsessed with baking and you know like I'm just wondering where Walk me through how two people write a book together that under, like, and also just as a different author, like you wrote it as a, as a different person. Yeah. Do you want to start, Marissa? This is one of those. I think. <laughs> well, I mean, I think uh, Carmen and I, we've talked about this a lot over the past month or so. We, I think the reason we, were, we knew we could do this in the first place is because we knew we had enough similarities in our writing style and our work ethic that we knew we could do this. Um, I don't think we thought it through enough to think like who loves baking and who loves definitely <laughs> not a baker. Like I just posted my Instagram story. My I do love baking. I make but... gingerbread cookies and they're like burnt little hockey <laughs> <laughs> um, although I didn't bake bread during during the pandemic yeah. that we had, and that's how the sourdough starter made its way in. Although someone in my book club just sent a message saying somebody just posted about sourdough starter tonight on Instagram. I just want to cry. Like we're just in, like, let's not, please, can we not go back there? We're going back. But I think you, I think what, what we needed was an outline. Like, I think you, you can't pick someone you don't believe in and you don't believe can get the job done and you don't love their writing, et cetera. And I think we both respected each other as writers, but the way we got it done is we outlined the hell out of it. And Mm -hmm. that is important. 
So yeah. and that's a collaborative pro- process. Like you're, you're just, we would talk, we would text, we would email just to figure it out. We would go back and forth and then, um, and we sold it on a partial manuscript and an outline. So the editors were into it at that point too. So we had their feedback on what they wanted and, and, and I think we had a good roadmap, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we did. We, but we were very diligent about making sure we had that outline and agreeing on the big points before. I mean, the, the nice thing, we have never written a holiday romance before. And one of the reasons we chose this was because we loved the idea of that happy ending and the ability to have these Sunni romances, which is just something we hadn't had a chance to write. And so it did, you know, having an idea of what we wanted that to look like together, like we knew we needed a happy ending and we wanted to have that really just festive, fun, sweet feel to the book. So we were very aligned. Like, I think that was how we did it Uh, because the pandemic had just hit and we were not ever together when we were writing. I mean, we have never written together with our two books. It has always had to be separate up to this point. So we had a great outline. And so how does that work though? Was it a case of you write one chapter and then Marissa looks at it and she writes the next chapter or like, how do you, how do you put it together? We, well, because we had the outline, we knew what had to happen in every chapter right up to the end. So we did with the holiday swap, we did switch chapters, but it wasn't like Marissa would write a chapter, then I would read it, and then I would write mine. We knew what we had to write mm-hmm. in each of those chapters because we had already outlined what was going to happen um, ahead of time. So we could, you, you sort of could just keep moving. Like if I had a chance to write two chapters and Marissa could only do one that day, it allowed us to not get stuck and, and to stay on, on deadline. So yeah, the outline. That that was that's really the secret. So you didn't yeah. each. I wondered. I was like, did one pick a twin and one wrote this person and one wrote that person, or just whichever? Not for whatever. that one. Oh. No, no, and we didn't do that. And and that is, I think, how you can press forward, and you know, um, because with our book that we'll talk about that's coming out next year, we, we each took a character because it uh, is a male and female character, and we would have to wait for each other, which which is it's a different way of doing it. Um, but with this one, we didn't, and then it was kind of neat to read it in the end. It's kind of like in a better better version of Mad Libs when you read your story and you're like, ah, you know, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's all, it, but it all worked out. Like it wasn't hilariously weird. It just all, it all worked yeah. out. Although there were certain, especially with the cell phones, we could not, the cell phones was like our plague was where is everyone's cell phone? Because it's important. Yeah. And do they switch cell phones? I mean, how many conversations did we have around, do they switch cell phones or do they not switch? Do they keep their own? Who's calling? Who do they know? But then we had to make a cell phone disappear for a while so that you, you could, you know, they take that leap of faith that maybe they couldn't contact each other. I mean, there are, it was a short, it happens over such a short time, but a lot of stuff had to happen with these twins in that time. Writing was easier before there were cell phones. I mean it because cell phones, yeah. couldn't the person, it just, yeah, I just, I want to complicate <laughs> everything. Then you're texting and then you have to figure out like which font you're writing the text in, you know, when you're doing this in the manuscript, it's always just, it's always just the thing. How you do you say that? Text? But that's really true because I was thinking about that when watching the new Sex of the City reboot because mm-hmm. there were no phones in the original show. And so they have to bring right. that whole technology up to speed. It's a whole other level of complicated that they didn't have to deal with the first time around. So it's something that I think a lot of people probably struggle with in that, in the world of bringing technology. But I mean, when you think about it, like, how many of you have your phone sitting right next to you if you're not yeah. on right now, right? Like it's a, it's a lifeline. Um, so holiday release, I feel like I came across this in chapters in October and mm-hmm. there were conversations in this, this book club has been going for seven years and wow. they really wanted happy, light, not heavy. I, put, I picked a few heavier ones earlier this year and so I committed to making this a little brighter space and so when I saw this one I thought oh my god this is almost it, it honestly could it reads like a movie it could easily be a movie have you considered or is it in the works for being like a, a mini show or a movie of some kind because it's written very much like it could be 
I mean, we hope so. We can't really talk about it. Right? <laughs> we, yes, you just can't talk about it. Yeah, I mean, the answer to that question is yes. We we want mm-hmm. it to be yeah. a movie. We wrote it thinking it would make a great movie. We basically were like, let's create like a Hallmark movie, you know, hoping that it would be Netflix or something, not necessarily on the page. Yes. So we're, we're hoping, and, and we can say there has been some interest in making that happen, but we can't. That's not answer. give any more details. Did you consider that when you were writing it, that, that you would keep that in mind as you were writing the book or was that not really a consideration at the time? I mean, not really, but I think we just always were like, think about a Hallmark movie. And when we lost, it the- was that like feel yeah. like the sense of it, right. Yeah. That, that, and we did our, our next one is not quite as, um, you know, sweet and clean. Like this one is very gentle on the page. And so we left all the hot and heavy stuff. It, it, it's happening off the page in the holiday swap. Um, our next one has just a little more spice on the page, teensy tiny bit. But I think that was our only real consideration when we were thinking about, because we did start talking about Hallmark. Like that was where it first began because I was wrapping presents and I like watching these holiday rom-coms and Marissa was reading some holiday romance at that time. And we just, it, that was really what spurred the on this idea you know mm. creating this festive holiday romance so anyway what was the hardest but, part aside from the cell phones our schedules it's just because we're not christina lauren or someone who this is our full-time job is doing these books so we have other books and and i think scheduling would be challenging even without that but i think our our schedules was the, the biggest challenge really i think we write quite easily together mm-hmm. and and, and we're fast we're fast and we're, all that was but just sometimes when one of us is waiting for the other it, it, that was hard and and it also I mean I have to say like the pandemic was made I don't know 2021 has been much harder than than 2020 and I I don't know how many books I wrote and released in the in this pandemic but I was trying to figure it out today it has been a lot and so it's just been a constant it's just been constant work. Like Marissa said, with our schedules, we've been on very different, um, you know, we are both working very hard on other projects at the same time. And then we were trying to write, you know, I'd be trying to write these really happy romantic scenes. And I would be like, okay, we're heading into the fourth wave lockdown and the kid is back home from school. Like it was just really hard. I found it hard to be in that mindset knowing how much people would enjoy reading that when it was done, but it was hard for me sometimes this year to get there, but we did it. I'm curious. Um, there are some, well, obviously everyone reads on the call, but there are some writers on the call and I am always interested to find out how you got your start as a published author. So Karma, maybe I'll get you to go first. Yeah, I am one of those authors who didn't ever want to be an author. And I published my first book at 41 Um, I went, I really wanted to be the Katie Quirk of the North. I wanted to be a broadcast journalist and I had gone to journalism school at Ryerson for my post-grad and then just, and I, I am fine. I am healthy. Everything's fine. But then I had cancer when I was 30, which was my last year of journalism school. And it really just completely shifted my focus. And I decided I couldn't go into broadcast. I needed to look at doing something that would allow me to have maybe a more relaxed life, a life with my boyfriend and husband in the city that I was living in. Um, So I started writing magazines for magazines and doing freelance, which I really loved, but it is a tough business. And I found it very frustrating. I had a number of articles that really mattered to me get orphaned. And I just, you know, I was curious about fiction, like how hard can it be to write a novel when you already write for a living? Um, it's really hard and very different, but so fun. So I just, I fell into it like in a way, I mean, I truly never would have expected that I would be, be an author in my forties, but that has been what's happened. And it's been just a great fun career. Writing fiction is a blast. It really is. So how did you get that first book published? Uh, I just, I wrote uh, two other books that were not good and learned everything I needed to learn, I think, to get that third book written that was good enough that I could get a, a, um, an agent interested. And then we got it sold to a publisher. So that's how my debut, but my debut was my third book written. 
and the other two are still in a drawer. They're my practice books. So I just, I was determined. I really wanted to have a book on the shelf. I like, once I decided that was my goal, I was just going to keep writing until it happened. And uh, it did, it took a little while, but I got there. Persistence paid off. Yeah. Marissa, what about you? I mean, our stories start, yeah, both, we both went to Ryerson. Um, I went to Ryerson for journalism. I mentioned to you at the beginning of the call, my dad um, was a community newspaper reporter and my uh, granny Maggie was a singer, but also a freelance newspaper writer. My grandfather um, wrote a syndicated column for the Toronto Star. He was actually an auto mechanic um, with a grade five education who ended up coming to Canada and becoming this this writer. And he has a best-selling book called The Car Owner's Manual, (laughs) Canadian bestseller. (laughs) Um, So there were a lot of writers in my family. So I, I didn't, I always was told like, you've got this writing gene and you're going to be a writer. And I always, I grew up thinking I will write a book and this is what I'm going to do. Um, But I didn't really get around to it for a while because it's not so easy to just sit down and get to the end of a novel or a publishable one, because I did go through a few um, not so great books. One I did, my first novel did sell to Key Porter, the Canadian publisher, went out of business before the book could come out. I wrote another one. It wasn't very good. Um, and at that time I had been working in magazines and TV and, and um, starting a family. So, but again, it, it's, it, as you just said, it's about persistence and just not giving up. Um, publishing is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And I think Carmen, and I know this very well. And it goes like this. It yeah. is never, it, it, you do not have this kind of trajectory ever, no matter mm-hmm. what. I mean, it really is. There's a lot of ups and downs, mm-hmm. but so yeah. it's just about, you kind of, you just have to keep your eyes on the road, especially when you get on the road, but it takes, there's a lot of off-roading that has so to much. Reading a lot of I'm medicine. off-roading it's all the time right now. It's a marathon, like... it's off-roading. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you, you, you have to be persistent and it's, I think a long story for both of us, but really it's about just not giving up even when maybe we could and should have and didn't. And now here we are. Yeah. Okay. Um, tell me about the next Maggie Knox book. Want me to go? I feel like you do a better job at this little (laughs) Every okay. time someone asks, I'm like, okay, Marissa will, is Marissa it? will say this. Like, you have another book. <laughs> no. What? I'm so tired. Yeah. Um, <laughs> your, our next book is called All I Want for Christmas. It is, we, we've pitched it as Nashville, the TV show meets The Hating Game, the novel. It's enemies to lovers story that takes place in another reality show setting. It's a, like an American Idol style show, but country music set in Nashville. And these two young singers, Max and Sadie, end up paired up for duet week, do not like each other, but have this hot sizzling chemistry when they sing together. And that's how things start. And they're thrown together and... Um, need to write an original hit Christmas song together, but they don't, they hate each other, but you know, obviously they don't really hate each other and it's really yeah. fun. So it's coming out. Um, I mean, it's fun, but it, it is like, as Karma said earlier, it's not, I don't know. I think 2021 was not going to let us write another light, fluffy, there was only going to holiday swap was the holiday swap. And now we have all I want for Christmas and there are darker themes. There are family drama and different things that have happened in all I want for Christmas. And, but it all, it is still a holiday romance. It's, but it, 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 it towards, is, yeah. yeah. The same place, which is the, the happy ending. We deliver on that, that happy ending. It's a slightly steamier. I mean, we have two young, hot characters in the music in- industry who are alone together in hotel rooms often. Yeah. And we, they had to do it. Like there was just, we couldn't get around that. Like it was, no stuff was going to happen. I mean, yeah, and it yeah. takes place over a year too. So it's not a week like they, yeah. Anyway. It's so funny that you say that. I have to show you this because look what I'm reading right now. Oh, (laughs) I love that book so much. It's one of my favorite. um, It's one of my favorite rom-coms for sure. Yeah, I just, I literally just started it. So that's super funny. Well, enjoy. enjoy You're in for a treat. (laughs) Um, Okay. You both also write very different books from Maggie Knox. 
Um, I'm going to start with Karma. Tell me about, I mean, you said you've written and released many, many books, but I see you have one coming out in February. One that came out in February. Did I mix up my release dates? You know what? I don't even know. I, I do not have a new book coming out until okay. February, 2023, but it is written. Oh, I mean, okay. I'm in edits on that one. Um, the recipe for perfect wife was my last fiction that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, that's and it I'm came thinking. out two years ago. Uh, but it came out in, in mass market here, paperback in February, ah, but it came out in, February. in 2019, which seems crazy. Uh, so, and then I wrote a, a nonfiction book called the 4% fix, which came out last December. And then we wrote the holiday swap and all I want for Christmas. And then my next book is called what wild women do. And um, it's similar to Recipe for a Perfect Wife. It's a dual narrative set in the 70s and the present day, uh, set in a great camp on the Adirondacks and has lots of great feminist themes and some dark themes and which is more the kind of stuff that I have written in the past. So, you know, the holiday swap was definitely, it was a complete 180 for me from what I normally write and what Mercer normally writes, but that was on purpose. Was it a good um, brain break to like completely take yourself out of the world you normally yeah. live in? Yeah, it was. It was fun to put characters in play. Like you could put them in hot water and and make things bad for them. But you knew, one, that there was going to be like lots of, you know, kissing time of, for these characters. But there was also going to be just that happy ending. And my books just don't. <laughs> I, I don't I, they're satisfying endings I think but they are not what anyone would probably call a happy ending so yeah it was it was it was a good brain break but I was all over the place with nonfiction, fiction holiday romance so I took on maybe a little much um for but sometimes that just happens right again it's not it's not a straight line and so you just you kind of have to go with where the ideas are and where the publishing like where publishing is what they're looking for so yeah that was a very roundabout question again I have been up for like 19 hours <laughs> so you've been up since I, maybe I so answered fun. it I'm not sure but um, that, that's, I think you did did I mostly okay so tell me about the other books you've written I think you kind of got there yeah we covered kind it. of yeah um all right Marissa, <laughs> Marissa what about you I mean you're getting a lot of attention right now for two reasons both for Maggie Knox and because you that that whole Reese Witherspoon connection thing. <laughs> there is that. that Tell is me that. about that phone call. Tell me about finding out that you picked one of your books. What was that like? So it wasn't a phone call. And actually I feel very lucky because all the other authors I've now met who are Reese's picks are like my editor called me or my agent called me, but I happened to, my agent and I are quite close and she decided we would go out for dinner. And then my editor came and surprised me. So I, I was actually catastrophically late because of a weird miscommunication. So I knew, and I was like, oh God, I've never done this. And then I got to the restaurant and I could see my editor sitting at the table across the street. And I immediately got really tearful for some reason. I don't know if I could just feel, I was like, oh, I haven't seen her since COVID. And wow, like I'm so touched that she would just come to this dinner. And then there was champagne on the table. And I, I had no, like there was not even any teeny tiny part of me that had ever hoped or dreamed of anything like this. So I sat down and started nervously babbling about how my editor had a book coming out and maybe we, I was like, maybe we should do a toast to your book. And this is like, we're, this is great. And then they were both acting really weird. So I started thinking maybe they're t breaking it to me gently that my career is somehow over. And <laughs> <laughs> Tell me nicely. And then my agent picked up her phone and was like, I'm going to tape this. And like, and I was like, I have what's happening. And then my editor told me, which I, I did post on my Instagram. Um, and I just started crying. I mean, I, I was shocked, but I watched the video a few times and I thought, okay, you were shocked, but you didn't say repeat that. Like did this, you know, I didn't, I, I was shocked, but I also, I immediately understood what was happening and it was just, it was an incredible moment. And then I cried so much and I kept saying, I either have to go home or I have to talk to my husband right now. But then I phoned him and I said, Joe Lucky is a Reese's book club pick. And he was like, Oh, <laughs> 
he just didn't not even on the same level at all like he just was like oh okay and then I was like well you're gonna have to do some googling and then I'll see you when I get home so by the time I got home and he's a tech guy so he had all this information that I didn't even know and he was really excited but um mm-hmm. It was, it was really, it was special. And I had three months where I had to keep it a secret. I couldn't, I was sworn to secrecy. I had to sign a non-disclosure agreement and I couldn't even tell Karma. And we talked all the time and I'd be like, well, I'm going to be really busy in December. (laughs) I can't really, you know, tell you why. (laughs) It was just so ridiculous. Um, And I'm so glad that the secret is out and it has been, it's been an incredible ride at Lucky's now in New York Times bestseller which is just the best Christmas gift I could imagine and so that's what's happening with me and tell me about your books tell me about like tell me about Lucky and about the other books that you've mm-hmm. kind of so I do have Lucky I have another novel um that I will hopefully release within the next few years that I'm, I'm not I don't think I'm quite ready to talk about yet but um before Lucky I wrote a, a novel called The Last Resort which was uh, a thriller about a couple's counseling retreat um, run by sort of a cult like sort of sinister guy and nobody, nobody is, is what they seem. And um, I think that I'm hoping that one of the things that happens um, with all the attention Lucky is getting is that that I loved the last resort and, and um, I'm hoping that that people read that right away after. Um, And uh, I have a few other novels, Mating for Life and Things to Do When It's Raining. And, and it, I always write about family dramas and secrets. And um, But I think The Last Resort and Lucky are more, they have that more thrillery kind of um, fast paced element to them. So, and I think my next novel is a really good combination of everything that I've ever done. And then we have All I Want for Christmas, which is which is a nice palate cleanser. It is, I think. And, and you know, it's yeah. so funny. I was just listening to you, Marissa, because we, like, my first four books are sad. That is the best way to describe them. They are emotionally draining books. And then I shifted, right, and wrote Recipe, and it is a different kind of story. And you did the same thing. Like, your first two books were much more in that women's fiction, emotional journey. And then you went to a more thriller Thing with last resort and then lucky is even like it's more heisty and has mm-hmm. that you know sort of sexy appeal of of um, Vegas and now we're writing holiday romance so I mean a lot of times authors will stay in one genre they will stay with one type of book there is a lot of talk around becoming branded when you're an author mm-hmm. and for some authors that's great I mean I that was not something I ever wanted to do and I think that's the same with you too, right, Marissa? Mm -hmm. Like we just want to write the stories that we're interested in, kind of push, push it a little bit, which is probably why we could just say, hey, let's Let's write a holiday romance. And then we're like, great, okay, let's go do it. And it, I think our publishers got kind of like they want, they they want you to to brand yourself. Like they do. And I think we there was a time, I think maybe especially for me, because I was like, you know, maybe I'm writing a romance, maybe I'm writing family, family drama, here's a thriller. And Simon Schuster was like, we love you, but like, <laughs> could you maybe explain? Um, but now that we've been just throwing everything at them for so long, I think it just is exciting to our editors and agents. And, and I think everyone loves the fact that we did a rom-com and yeah. Yeah. But I, and think I changed it, publishers. Like yeah. I completely changed publishers when I changed my type of book and mm-hmm. you know that's why I said it's like this mm-hmm. it is just never a straight line for sure mm-hmm. it sounds very mm-hmm. stressful yeah <laughs> it's yeah. stressful mm-hmm. it, I mean, there were days like that dinner was amazing but like do note that I was champagne on the table editor and agent taking me out for dinner and even so I was like what they're about to tell me my career is over. Like that's what <laughs> is happening. Because it's so hard. There is more tough news or mm-hmm. there is more disappointing news. Like then there is that. And I mean, really like for Marissa, that's like the, you know, you don't really get news like that often in your whole career, mm-hmm. but there are, there are great things that happen, but then there are so many things that just are not good and it doesn't work out and you love a book and you put it out and it isn't well received or, you know, it's just the wrong time or there's a pandemic and they shut down all the bookstores. Like it's just, yeah, it's, it's hard. It is a hard. 
But the business. holiday swap, I will say, aside from a few stocking issues we've had recently, just because it sold so well, like they're yeah. out in certain places, but this was one where it really has been, we've had yeah, pretty smooth. Nice. Like our editor, I know. Jinx I think it. Okay. Don't jinx I think, it. I think it's okay. It's just, it's been, it's been a pretty, we have a lovely team and team. they're, yeah. And they're always like, even if it's just normal news, like your book sold as expected this week, they deliver it. They're like, we have such lovely things to tell you. Cheerleaders with, yeah, they're like, you know, you did not like your sales did not go down this week, guys. (laughs) And it's so, and every time I see the email, I'm like, oh, oh," but I've, I've stopped. Like I've, it's, it's helped me not be so conditioned to expect the bad news right <laughs> so it's been nice you've got a good hype squad is what I'm hearing we, yeah yes and it has For gone sure. I mean, frankly I mean 10 or yeah. whatever it was 10 weeks on the bestseller list is, yeah I think we did pretty well we did well yeah. is it a complicated relationship with you both having your own lives having your own agents having your own publishers like was does it ever get complicated when like figuring out stuff to do with Maggie Knox or has it been pretty smooth no, our yeah. agents work for the same agency and they're friends, I think. So it's all fine. And, and, and it's letters. just mostly like our publisher um, in Canada was a, what, like my editor in Canada then moved over to be our editor for Holiday Swap. So there's already a lot of, of connectedness between us, like between our teams and it really wasn't. I, the only thing that was really challenging, to be honest, were our schedules. Like I, it just, there were times we are the deadlines are very tight because the books come out one a year. And so you really have, I mean, we're like months, just a few months to get the book written. And then there are edits and we have three editors for the different markets. So they're all editing simultaneously. And so everything has to be really tight and that can be tricky. But uh, Canadian girls, but you said it in the States, but you had the little Canadian shout outs. How did you pick where you were going to set the, the story for Holiday Swap and, and decide also for the, for the next one that it was going to be like that, that Nashville vibe? Why did you choose the States? Well, there is a lot of Banff in our next novel. Oh, it's the, yeah. quite a bit of it and more and more of it when we edit because there is a little... <laughs> They go to Banff. It's a long story why, but they're in Banff for a lot of, a lot of, that's where the, you know, happens. Um, <laughs> yeah. of course, right. <laughs> so, yeah. but I think, I don't even think it was a question for the holiday swap of if there was somewhere in Canada, we could set it because we, we, we knew we had the reality show. And um, so generally that kind of thing is shot in LA and then Hallmark movies or the ones we love the most are the ones where it's just you're suddenly two hours outside of LA and you're in a snowy town and I don't think that there's anywhere but California that you can do that yeah that was that was it really for that one we needed LA we needed for the LA. reality show and then we needed to have a town which we made up yeah uh, because it's just so much easier that way but and then Nashville was because we well we both love the show Nashville and we knew we wanted to do a reality singing show for these two characters so it just all we mm-hmm. have never been to Nashville. Um, no. We had hoped to go, but of course, COVID has different ideas. I mean, that is another tricky thing too, It is trying to write your setting when you've never been. So thank goodness for Google, for mm-hmm. friends, for just people that I have, like you put out questions to Twitter and you get great answers about, mm-hmm. about people like from people who live there. So they're, you know, they know exactly what all the nuances of are of the town. And um, the yeah. Now- I mean, seriously, yeah. I I feel like I've, I've been there. <laughs> Might as well have been there. <laughs> okay, what's the release date for that one? I mean, I'm Is guessing it's very similar. early, like October, first week early of October. October. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, I have monopolized the conversation. I'm going to open this up to the other people patiently listening here. If anybody has a question, maybe just raise your hand so that I can bring you up on the screen so that you'll be included in the recording and not just your boys. Anybody will raise your hand. I know you have questions. You always have questions. <laughs> Deb, are you trying to unmute? Yes. Okay. Hang on. I'll hit the button and I'll bring you up. I see what's happening here. <laughs> You're still muted. I can see your lips moving, but I don't, there you go. There you go. 
Uh, okay, I'm talking. Hi, girls. Hello. Hi. I, really, I really enjoyed your novel. It was really lots of fun to read at Christmas when everybody's a little stressed. Um, lots of things going on. Pandemic coming worse again and everything. So I really enjoyed it. Would you ever consider, so you've, you've written another book together and it's another rom, rom com kind of, kind of with a little bit more spice. Would you ever consider writing a different sort of novel together? I don't, I don't know. I mean, probably not because I think you can maybe never say never. I, I don't know, but we did, <laughs> we did think about writing a thriller yeah. And before we did the rom-com, we thought, what would we write? Why don't we write a thriller? And then we both decided we didn't want to write a thriller because okay. we wanted something that was just happier. You know, we right. didn't want to kill people. We wanted to <laughs> make people fall in love. So that was where we, and it just, you know, it was just such a nice change from what we were, what we were doing. Right. And, and I think it, you'd love to write a horror, if I can say that. I really want to write a horror. That's, and I do not. I, I don't think, I mean, I get scared. <laughs> so <laughs> I just, yeah. So I think maybe we just want different things for what we would want to write next. I think Carmen <laughs> and I could probably write anything together if we really yeah. put our minds to it. I don't know what would happen if we went dark, though. I, I don't know if it would just, I don't know. Would it go too dark? <laughs> Like I don't know either. Like, we were like, we're going to write the lightest, most fluffiest, delicious book. And then we did that. So if we were like, we're going to, we could, I don't right. know. Could now I'm bad. sorry. Like, hmm, could we write the dark? <laughs> <weirdest?" Like, laughs> but then I'm going to write all this scary stuff. And then you'll be like, it's too scary. I want to, you know. I didn't read your chapter. <laughs> I, I couldn't read it. It was nighttime and I couldn't read it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't ever. Karma. I saw you automatically shake your head. When, you, when, when you said, could we write, could you write something different together? You automatically shook your head. No, because I feel like we, this was such a specific thing that we decided to do. I mean, it really started truthfully as just a, it was almost a joke. It was like a, wouldn't it be fun if we could collaborate? And so we're not always working alone because you're so isolated when you write and it, you know, you miss just having that connection with other people. Like I miss, I miss meetings. I used to work in corporate in a corporate job and it's ridiculous to say, but I miss meetings. I miss those long, boring sit at a table and try to pretend you're interested meetings. I want to go, if anyone wants to invite me to a meeting, um, you know, when everyone goes back to work, I'd like to come, but <laughs> yeah, I, I think we just, I don't know. This was just, this was a project that was kind of a passion project for us. And like Marissa said, I think we could write anything together, but this was the thing. I mean, mm -hmm. right. yeah. 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 Right. Thanks well, for the question. <laughs> thanks, Deb. Thank okay. you. Okay. Who's next? Or like wave your hand at me and I will bring you up and unmute you. Oh, Mike's got a question. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Um, yeah, thanks for uh, coming on the uh, on the chat tonight and everything. It's really interesting to hear other authors and how they kind of work together, especially in your unique, to my mind, situation of the two coming one kind of thing. Um, but question I've got, because I always run into this myself in my own writing, is getting into a writer's block or getting into a point where I just can't seem to get that creative jive out. Do you guys have any techniques of your own that you use if you find yourself stuck to kind of get yourself unstuck or does it ever happen? I mean, I, I think deadlines, right? We just keep going. We just, <laughs> I am a big believer in button seat and you just, I don't personally believe in writer's block. I understand the feeling of being stuck, but I think that there's a lot of procrastination involved in this idea of being blocked and, and having writer's block, like it's this thing that's just come over you and you cannot move past it. But I'll go for a walk. I'll talk to my friends. Like I will often, you know, Marissa and I have an ongoing chat with another writer friend of ours. And we will often be brainstorming things in there. So it's just finding, like giving your brain a break and then coming back. But I force myself to write a lot of the time when I'm not feeling it. Because you can always edit it later. I just force it out 
<laughs> I think that's come through years of just, you know, having to meet deadlines, like Marissa said. Um, but for me, I just, yeah. and journalism too, because the deadlines are so tight. You, you do not have time to be like, oh, I don't know. I'm waiting for my muse to show up. So um, yeah, you, I'm in. You can also, sorry, Carmen. I'm no, no, go ahead. Um, sorry, now I lost, I interrupted you and then lost my train of thought. Like <laughs> maybe I've been up since one thirty. Um, I think also <laughs> something that you, that we sometimes realize after, if you're stuck on something, you don't have to work on that chapter. I don't know. Maybe this is not your style so much karma, but if I'm stuck on something, I'll just write in that chapter by the end of this chapter, the character has to have solved this problem. I will figure it out later. And then I just go to the next chapter and then that often solves the problem for me in the moment. There's the problem is still waiting. That was, was tripping you up, but it's your book, right? Especially in a first draft or or something that you're just writing um, on your own. You don't have to, to have it all perfect. Nobody knows. And sometimes if you're stuck, you, it has, it's because it's not the right thing. I've anytime I have not been able to solve the problem, it's because it's not, I I have to look at it from a different perspective. So, you know, if this, if I were, a lot of times you write the thing that feels most obvious to you. And sometimes if you can shift it and say, well, what is the opposite of what I have just written? And if I put that on the page, what does that look like? Which is a fun exercise sometimes because you'd be surprised at how often you, you know, a whole new thread comes out or a plot point or I've added entire characters by doing that, which is annoying because then you have to go back and thread them in, in the back end. But um, yeah. But I think both of us are also advocates of what, as Karma said, get, getting your button, button seat. Um, yeah. if you in And even making up self-imposed deadlines um, for yourself because deadlines really do work for us. And just sometimes working through it, but not listening to that voice in your head that might be telling you the way you're writing isn't very good. I think that sometimes can trip you up if you're writing and it's, it never comes out the way you imagine it the first time, right? It doesn't, you're not writing. We're not, the holiday swap was not perfection on the page and sweet and funny and amazing um, right away. And we don't edit as we go. That's the other thing that we, you and I both do. I think that we, we do not edit as we go. We mm-hmm. write a first draft and then we go back and we edit because if you're constantly working here and, and trying to perfect this, you just lose the momentum of, of having that, that story keep moving. I mean, you can fix everything later, mm-hmm. almost everything, or you cut it out. You just, yeah, that's it. what I found with my own stuff was I, if I stopped to edit, stopped to edit, it was doing more damage than good. So I would for just sure. like, go finish it, then go back. And I sometimes found for me what worked was if I got into a jam somewhere, I didn't stop writing. I just worked on another project. And yeah. sometimes the answer would come from that. And then I would come back and do it. But anyway, I just was curious if there was yeah. techniques that you guys maybe had. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Anybody else? Um, anybody, anybody else? <laughs> I'm very surprised at how quiet this group is. It's normally they're quite chatty. Maybe we just talked about everything. I mean, there are two of us. I do so. appreciate your relationship though. I can tell that you guys genuinely like each other, which makes a difference, I think, on a project probably, especially a happy project. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have been friends for a long time. Like we've been through lots of ups and downs together and, you know, there is, that is, I think the foundation of, of our relationship, of our writing relationship. It was not always easy. Like we battled when we did this project together, which I think is normal for anyone who's working. Sometimes we would joke. I mean, we joke about each other being like our work wife and uh, there would be times where we'd be like, look, we're already married. We do not need another you know, we're we don't not need another married to each other. So we need to, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's just always keep that in mind. So, but I think that's why it worked too. Oh, Candace has a question. Candace, go ahead. Well, hi guys. Um, 
I just wanted to say that I loved it. It was like, that's my favorite kind of book. So mm -hmm. a very um, guilty pleasure of reading the rom-coms. And one of the reasons I joined Sounds Club is to try and read more. So when I saw this month, so I was like, yes. <laughs> so um, totally go for the Jasmine Gilroy, Christina Lauren, Sally Thorne all the time. So mm. I'm very, this was so fun for me. And I always get like, I love being creative, but never know how and have often dreamed about writing and writing a book. So after I write, read something like this, I'm always like, I just need to start writing again. But you get stuck. Yeah. So I just love hearing those real life stories and um, how you guys have done it. And less of a question, more of a thank you. That's oh, so thank nice. Thank you. You're so welcome. And you should, you should try, like, get yeah. back to writing for sure. It is, I mean, it, it just... It, it is um, it is hard, but it's fun and it does require some effort and some discipline. And of course, you know that, right? You've done it before, but oh, my dog. My dog. That's so nice. Dog wants oh, you to dogs. write. Yeah, your dog wants you to write. Exactly. <laughs> yes, it's and like we said, it's it's the hardest thing about writing is kind of like the hardest thing about doing a workout just getting yourself to Started. wherever you're going to do it and start doing it. Okay. Uh, any other questions before I let these ladies go? Karma probably needs to go to bed at some point. <laughs> this is way past karma bedtime, honestly. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's like already past Because yeah. you're always up early. One thirty is a bit... A, a I'm normally up between yeah. 4 and 5, but one thirty mm -hmm. is like... That's not, I mean, people are going to bed at 1.30. I understand this. It's So are you, do you write during the day as if it is your nine to five job or are you a right in the dark at night when your kids are sleeping or early in the morning? Like when do you guys have your, when do you do your best work? For, For me, me, it's early. Earlier. Yeah, me too. Definitely, yeah, more, not as early as karma, although depending on the deadline, you, you are very, like by the time I wake up, half the time karma has written like three books. <laughs> That's not true, but sometimes it does feel like it sometimes if I get up really early. Yeah. Um, but that's I can't write in the afternoon or a night anymore. I used to, but I don't like, I just reserve all the tasks, like administrative stuff for the afternoon or. Cause there's so much else involved. I mean, everyone thinks if you're an author, you're just writing all the time, but I write first thing in the morning because once nine o'clock hits, then there are emails and just other administrative stuff that has to happen. And mm -hmm. then I'm basically starting to get ready for bed by about noon. You know, I have to begin my bedtime procedures so that I'm ready for <laughs> my 9 p.m. sleep time. But yeah, it's hard. And then we have kids and they come home and um, yeah. Okay, my Morning. last question for each of you. It's a two-parter. The first question is, what is the best book you've read lately? And what book would you recommend to people that isn't your own? It doesn't have to, it, I guess it could be the same book, but I'm typically the book that people automatically recommend isn't necessarily the one they've read most recently. So best book you've read lately and a book you would recommend. I'll go Karma because I know for, Karma reads like a ton and this question always stumps her because she just, I, so I will say right now I'm reading uh, These Precious Days by Ann Patchett. Actually, when uh, I think it was Mike asked his question about uh, Writer's Block 2, she had said something in the essay I read last night about how she never, she treats writing and editing very separately. And I would highly recommend that, that essay collection. It's, mm -hmm. it's so great that it, it just, um, it just makes you feel like she, you, you can't even, you're in wonder um, as you, I, I feel I'm not alone and, and it's not hyperbole. They're really excellent essays. Um, so, and I'm rereading Esperanza's Box of Saints by Maria Amparo Escandon, who's a Reese's Pick author I met when I was in LA. And um, it just so happened that that 20 year old book was my favorite when I was 23. So meeting her was incredible and she's just such a kind woman. So I'm, I'm rereading that one. And that's an interesting one. She wrote LA weather, which is the Reese's pick, but that one is um, like really magic realism. And, and I like magic. It's, yeah, it's a very, very cool book and, and getting to meet her and get a signed copy 20 years later of this meaningful book has been really cool. And I would really recommend it. She's a fantastic writer. All right, Karma, you've had a minute and a half. I've had a minute. I, I would say, okay, thank you for that because it did give me a moment <laughs> to just 
try to gather my thoughts. But the best book I've read this year for sure was Braiding Sweetgrass. I don't know if anyone else has read that. That was, I don't know, that book to me was just perfection. It's beautiful. It's poetry. It is um, about all the indigenous culture and plants and the connectedness of the earth. And it was, it is a beautiful book. Um, and then I'm really into horror. So right now I'm rereading Rosemary's Baby and The Shining, which uh, those are, you know, they're on my Kobo and I read them literally in bed in the dark because my husband needs it to be very dark. So I have a Kobo that has back back it's backlit so I can I can sort of under the covers read my horror um it's my bedtime horror I don't know I know that's a strange thing there must be other people who like to read horror at bedtime but those are that's what I'm reading right now all right <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that but I know <laughs> it's okay that might be I know. why you've been up since one o'clock in the morning or maybe not <laughs> No, it puts me right to sleep. I don't know what it is. I just, I really am a horror fan. So is Stephen King your like jam with horror or is there someone else that you like better? Ooh, it's so hard. I I mean, I, it's more about the book than the author for me with horror. Like Bird Box was a favorite of mine. Um, I mean, Stephen King is amazing. He truly is such a king of the genre, but yeah. I'd like more female horror authors. So if anyone ever comes across that, there aren't as many. Maybe someone you send me a note. It. Maybe you should just do well, it. Well, I'm going to try. It's like it's on my list, but I need a little break. We have other books that have to be finished first. So <laughs> I'll get there eventually. Oh, someone else reads horror at bedtime. Courtney. I can okay, see Courtney good, was Courtney. like, yeah, yeah, I do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, we have one um, joy in our book club. We read The Long Walk, um, which is one of Stephen King's Richard oh. Bachman books. And she was telling us about how when she read The Shining, she had to like put it on the front step or in somewhere because it scared her so bad. She didn't want it in the house. I understand. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I there's that. all different levels of... We are um, all different. Yeah, we are all different in what we like to read, for sure. I yeah. appreciate that. I do. It is terrifying, but so good yeah. well ladies I appreciate you so much for giving me an hour of your time especially when you're very very tired um but we also really really enjoyed your book so I appreciate you and your writing and your journalism in the past as well because well it's a hard career and you know mm. I'm gonna do it so I appreciate you for all your work and uh wish you lots of luck on uh, everything forward and we will watch for the movie that will inevitably probably come out i would <laughs> laugh out loud if it was a hello sunshine movie but i will not <laughs> i will not speculate that it will be a hello sunshine movie at this point because i know you can't say anything but uh thank you so much everyone else if you want to hang out i will talk to you about january um but i will let these two ladies get on with their evening thanks for being here ladies thank, thank you, you so much, much. thanks sam thanks, thanks everyone Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.